Well, good morning, Southeast. It is good to be in the house of the Lord together today. Good to see each and every one of you here. Thank you to those of you who are joining on Facebook Live and those of you who will be catching up with us on YouTube later on. Our opening scripture today is found in Revelation, the very last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 21, and the last paragraph of chapter 21, it starts at verse 22. So Revelation chapter 21, verse 22. Give you a moment to get there. Very end of the Bible, next to the last chapter of the Bible, Revelation chapter 21, beginning at verse 22. I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does, not, who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are grateful to be in your house today. We thank you for waking us this morning and for gathering us together in your spirit. We pray that you would be honored and glorified in everything that's said and done. Lord, draw us nearer to you as well as to each other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand and sing. Uh, the song is Waymaker.
Amen. And that is true. He is our way maker, a miracle worker, and he never stops working. Amen. Our psalm today is Psalm number 34. And I invite you to turn there with me, Psalm number 34. And if you have a different translation uh, other than the NIV, just follow along. If you have an NIV, I invite you to join me in praying this aloud. And then we're going to go to our time of prayer, and we'll close that with the Lord's Prayer together. And we want to remember those who are grieving today, especially remember Angela and Rodrigo. Today is the viewing for Angela's grandmother, and so we want to lift them in prayer and their grief. And remember Marla and her family and the passing of her mom. And I know that there are others of you who are grieving various, various uh, losses and so want to remember each one also want to remember those who are dealing with illnesses and that the look pray for them that the lord would bring healing and um, we just look to him and we trust him and of course you know that there are all kinds of situations going on uh, in our country and around the world uh, from from war to immigration issues to weather issues just uh, lots, of, lots of tragedy, and we need to pray for our leaders, our president, Congress, world leaders, to have God's wisdom and to seek the Lord first in all things. And um, all those in Afghanistan, the Taliban, uh, pray that God would soften their hearts as well. Psalm number 34, join with me. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. A righteous man may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. 
Evil will slay the wicked. The foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems his servants. No one will be condemned who takes refuge in him. Amen. Let's continue to pray. Father in heaven, we are here today because you heard our cry. And we thank you. We thank you for how you have met us, how you have met our needs, how you have brought us together, how you have made a way wherein it just seemed like there, were no, there was no way at times. We're thankful for that this morning. We recognize that it's in you that we find salvation, that we find peace, that we find joy, that we find hope, that we find life. Indeed, you are our maker. You're the creator of the heavens and the earth, the fullness therein. It all belongs to you. And you made us, each and every one of us. None of us are here by accident. None of us are a mistake. None of us are purposeless. That you created each and every one of us intentionally on purpose. And you have given us the purpose to glorify you, to reflect your goodness, to reflect your love, your grace to one another and to all that you bring across our paths. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us to live into that purpose. And for those who may be feeling lost and without purpose today, we pray that you would speak your purpose afresh into their hearts this morning and that they would realize that you have given them breath for this day to glorify you and to reflect your goodness to someone. And Father, we thank you for how you hold us together, that you didn't just set us out here and make us and then go your way and see what we would do. But Lord, you're engaged in our lives day by day. You're the one who gives us breath and wakes us up each morning. And you're the one who provides for us. And you hold us together when it seems that everything will come undone. And when we don't know which way to go, you're there with us in the midst of it. And like we sang, you're at work even when we don't see you at work because you're constantly engaged in our lives and clearing a path for us. Empower us, Lord, to walk in that path. Thank you for food, for clothing, for places to lay our head. Thank you for family, for friends. Lord, just the many ways that you show your care for us and your love towards us. And then, Father, we are especially grateful that even when we were at enmity against you, that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, that we might be reconciled to you and that we might have peace with you. You are our redeemer. You are our savior. Thank you for that gift of salvation this morning. And we pray, Father, that you would forgive us and cleanse us afresh for all the times this week that we failed to obey you, whether that was doing things that we knew you wanted us to do or whether that was avoiding the things that you were telling us not to do. And Lord, we pray for your mercy afresh upon us today. And we pray, Father, that you would empower us to live faithful and true to you and to one another. Help us, Lord, to trust you wholeheartedly. Grant us your spirit, Lord, to empower us to hold nothing back from you, but to give you our very selves, to give you our futures, to give you our past, to give you the things that we're proud of, to give you the things that we're ashamed of. Lord, help us to hold nothing back from you, but to trust everything to you completely. And we pray, Father, that you would also increase our love for one another. Help us, Lord, especially in loving those for whom we have a hard time loving. Uh, whether it's people closest to us, whether it's people farthest from us, but Lord, help us to increase in love today and help us to show the same love to others that you have shown to us. Help us to give grace as we have received grace from you. And Father, we thank you for the many that you have brought into our lives to help us follow Jesus more closely. And we confess our need that we don't do very well when we try to follow Jesus just all by ourselves. And so thank you for bringing people into our lives to walk with and to help us follow Jesus more closely. And we pray, Lord, that you would use each of us to help someone else become a closer follower of Jesus. Use us to encourage somebody. Use us to listen to somebody. Use us to help somebody. But Lord, help us to be attentive to how you want to love someone through us, how you want to minister to someone through us, and help us to be open and available and obedient to you. Lord, we count it such a privilege to cast all of our cares upon you, to bring all of life to you. We pray especially that you would be near to those who are grieving today. We ask you to be with Angela and Rodrigo and the final viewing of, of Angela's grandmother, Stella, today. We pray that you would comfort the family, that, they would, that you would draw them near unto you, and Lord, that you would give them your peace. 
We pray for Marla and her, for her family and for her siblings and that you would comfort them in the loss of her mother. Lord, as only you can, and we pray that you would work in redemptive ways that in each and every loss that you would draw us near to you. And Father, we ask you to be with those who are facing some pretty big decisions. We pray that you would give wisdom and discernment and guidance and the ability to trust you. We pray, Father, for those who don't know which way life is going to go, uh, what direction to take. Uh, Lord, sometimes we find ourselves just at what seems like to be the hands of circumstances. But Lord, you're at work in all the circumstances and you redeem all the circumstances. And so, Lord, our hope is in you and we're able to live with confidence because of who you are and because of how you are at work in the midst of all things. Lord, we pray for our nation, so many different things to bring to you, whether it's border and immigration issues, whether it's COVID issues, whether it's issues in terms of Afghanistan. And Lord, these are just tip of the iceberg. Lord, we bring our nation to you and we pray, Lord, that you would empower our leaders to act wisely and most of all, that they'd all be humble enough to seek you first. And we think of world situations, Lord, uh, whether it has to do with earthquakes or hurricanes or whether it has to do with war, but we pray, Father, that you would soften hearts to seek you and that you would make a way and that you would accomplish your will in each and every situation. Lord, we pray for your church today, wherever it's gathered, here on this corner, across the street, downtown, all parts of the globe, some places where it's easy to gather, some places where you have to gather in secret. But Lord, we pray that in each and every place where your people are gathered, we pray that you would anoint us afresh with your Holy Spirit and that you would empower us to live as faithful witnesses to you, to the truth of the gospel, the salvation that we have, the peace that we have, the love that we have received. Help us, Lord, to share it. And we pray that because of your work in our lives, it would be evident to all those around us that you are the way maker, that you are the God who indeed saves and redeems. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 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 Well, it's great to have all of you here today. And again, thank you all of those who are joining uh, through Facebook or eventually through YouTube. Uh, offering plates are in the back there. We're not going to pass them. Uh, but thank you for your faithfulness in giving, whether you mail it in, whether you drop it off, whether you use online giving. Thank you for that. A uh, couple of announcements. Uh, Friday nights are good. And so 6 o'clock, we have a great meal. Monica and Deja are in the kitchen fixing that up. And then 7 o'clock, we chew on the word a little bit. We're working with the parables of Jesus. And uh, if you're interested in joining on Zoom, you haven't done that yet, uh, just let me know and we'll get you a Zoom link. Um, but we're having a good outdoor Bible study here on Friday nights at 7. And appreciate all of you who are able to make it one way or the other. Uh, the other announcement is that men's retreat is on the calendar, September 24 to 26. It's up at Camp Palomar. It's a Friday night through a Sunday morning. And the cost is $150 per man. And so if that's something you're interested in, please let me know. Uh, we'll get a group together and get on up that mountain. September 24 to 26, Camp Palomar, uh, $150 a person. Okay, the question for the day. The question for the day is this. Think back to a thunderstorm or an earthquake. Maybe it's a firestorm, but some storm or earthquake or, you know, big happening that kind of left a mark on you, like you're not forgetting that one. And share that with somebody. So thunderstorm that you'll never forget, or the earthquake that really shook you up, uh, or maybe it was a firestorm, whatever it might be, but some storm, some kind of big event that really shook you up, and share about that with your neighbor.
Okay, I hear some good stories being told. And uh, I think of, uh, well, just this, this last road trip that we went on back to Michigan. We were driving through Albuquerque and going up east uh, out of Albuquerque on US 40 through the mountains. And a thunderstorm just kind of dropped in on us. And you could see the lightning and the thunder and it was coming down hard and then it turned to hail and you know you're on this mountain interstate and it's kind of like from here to el centro where you get a lot of a lot of curves and you can't see in front of you because the rain's coming down so hard and you can see kind of lights everybody had their flashers on but it's hard to tell exactly which lane you're in and you don't want to stop because somebody might rear end you but you don't want to keep going because you don't know if somebody stopped in front of you. And it's just really, you know, kind of, kind of scary. Probably only lasted five minutes, but I think it felt like 30. And the thing that got me, which all of these, is that you're out of control. That you're up against something that is bigger than you. And there's that sense that Man, when is this going to end? Because I can't control it, and I don't know how long it's going to take to get through it, and it is way bigger than me. And I think that's the same thing in terms of the firestorm. I heard somebody talking about the firestorms from years ago that left ashes all over San Diego. That's the thing about the earthquakes. Uh, Joe Rodriguez, if you're watching, I thought about you with this question in terms of some of the waves that you've come up against and that you've surfed and just wondering, have you ever met a wave that you couldn't surf, that you couldn't control? And I just think that we go through these storms and the thing that makes a storm such a storm, we can't do anything about it. That we're just there in it. And we realize that we're up against something that is actually way bigger than us. And our only hope is to somehow ride it out because it's bigger than us. And so with that, I think you'll see how that question kind of fits with some of the stuff in Isaiah chapter 24 today. And that's where our message comes from as we make our journey through Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 24. And I'll go ahead and read the chapter, and then I'll talk a little bit about this section of Isaiah that we're entering into, and then we'll focus in on chapter 24 in detail. So Isaiah chapter 24. Isaiah chapter 24. See, the Lord is going to lay waste the earth and devastate it. He will ruin its face and scatter its inhabitants. It will be the same for priest as for people, for master as for servant, for mistress as for maid, for seller as for buyer, for borrower as for lender, for debtor as for creditor. The earth will be completely laid waste and totally plundered. The Lord has spoken this word. The earth dries up and withers. The world languishes and withers. The exalted of the earth languish. The earth is defiled by its people. They have disobeyed the laws, violated the statutes, and broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore, a curse consumes the earth. Its people must bear their guilt. Therefore, earth's inhabitants are burned up and very few are left. The new wine dries up and the vine withers. All the merrymakers groan. The gaiety of the tambourines is stilled. The noise of the revelers has stopped. The joyful harp is silent. No longer do they drink wine with a song. The beer is bitter to its drinkers. The ruined city lies desolate. The entrance to every house is barred. In the streets they cry out for wine. All joy turns to gloom. All gaiety is banished from the earth. The city is left in ruins. Its gate is battered to pieces. So will it be on the earth and among the nations. And as when an olive tree is beaten or as when gleanings are left after the grape harvest. They raise their voices. They shout for joy. From the west they acclaim the Lord's majesty. Therefore in the east give glory to the Lord. Exalt the name of the Lord, the God of Israel, and the islands of the sea. From the ends of the earth we hear singing. Glory to the righteous one. But I said, I waste away. I waste away. Woe to me. The treacherous betray. With treachery the treacherous betray. Terror and pit and snare await you, O people of the earth. 
Whoever flees at the sound of terror will fall into a pit. Whoever climbs out of the pit will be caught in a snare. The floodgates of the heavens are open. The foundations of the earth shake. The earth is broken up. The earth is split asunder. The earth is thoroughly shaken. The earth reels like a drunkard. It sways like a hut in the wind. So heavy upon it is the guilt of its rebellion, and it falls never to rise again. And that day the Lord will punish the powers in the heavens above and the kings on the earth below. They will be herded together like prisoners bound in a dungeon. They will be shut up in prison and be punished after many days. The moon will be abashed, the sun ashamed. For the Lord Almighty will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before its elders gloriously. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the gift of your word this morning. And once again, thank you for gathering us together. We pray that as we come before your word, that you would speak afresh to us and that you would open our ears to hear you, our hearts to receive you, our minds to be obedient to you. We pray, Lord, that you would have your way. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. Well, that's a pretty tough passage of scripture. And um, at one level, maybe not too hopeful. At another level, I think maybe so. But let me talk a little bit about where we're at in Isaiah. So we just came through this section, chapters 13 to 23, that are kind of known as Isaiah's prophecies or oracles against the nations. And you'll remember that Israel was in kind of a tough spot at this time that they had a king by the name of Ahaz who had made a very, very bad decision, that instead of trusting the Lord, he decided to trust the, the future, the well-being of his people to the king of Assyria, which was a horrible decision because Assyria came in and Assyria took over. Assyria took a lot of their wealth, took some of their people, took their land, really just devastated the place. Ahaz died but the people are still dealing with the bad decisions of Ahaz. And the next kings are still dealing with the bad decisions of Ahaz. And so chapters 13 to 23 is like Isaiah is saying, look, here's the word to a Babylon. Babylon's going to fall. So don't trust Babylon. Don't go from one bad decision trusting Assyria to another bad decision of trusting Babylon. Turn back to the Lord. And so 13 to 23, kind of picking off nation after nation after nation from east to west, kind of with the news, these nations offer no hope. In fact, these nations are going to come to the place where they realize that it's our God who offers hope. And so we need to lead the way in trusting in our God. Okay, and that's kind of the big message of chapter 13 to 23. Now we move into a new section, and it's chapters 24 to 27. And in this new section, instead of focusing on kind of one nation after one nation after one nation, now the whole earth is in view. Now we're kind of talking cosmic. So there's not just one spot on the earth or one people of the earth, but we're kind of talking about the whole globe. And you'll notice that at places, it's not even about the globe, it's also about the heavens. And so this is kind of a cosmic picture, if you will. And the other thing that's going on is not only does he have the whole of creation in view, but it's like he has the whole of history in view. That this is where God is moving history. And so at times, Isaiah sees kind of close that this is what God is doing next. This is going to happen in our lifetime you know, his contemporaries. And other times he's able to kind of see further into the future, that this is what God is up to long term. And I don't know when this is going to happen, but this is what God is going to do. Well, here in chapters 24 to 27, it's like he's looking at the end, that this is how it's all going to play out, that this is where God is moving everything. Okay, so Isaiah has been given this gift of God to be able to kind of see near to be able to see, I don't know, intermediate, but also to be able to see deep, to see that this is where God is moving history. And so that's what's going on in chapters 24 to 27. It's kind of this deep view of where God is moving everything. And we're going to see that over these next few chapters, he uses this phrase, in that day. And when he talks about in that day, we might even say in that age. 
that God is bringing about a new day, a new age, a new time. And God's going to bring this age to conclusion and open up that new day. So in that day refers to kind of the conclusion of this age and the opening up of that new age, that new day. And so we'll see that language used as we move across here. And so, you know, we're kind of backing up a little bit. Instead of thinking about, you know, Babylon or last week it was Tyre, Egypt in the middle there. Now we're thinking the whole earth and we're thinking all of history and where God is moving everything. Okay, with me so far? Kind of catching it? Okay, now let's begin to walk through chapter 24. And in this chapter, the focus is especially on God bringing things to a conclusion this age, this day. And so notice how it opens up in these first three verses. See, the Lord is going to lay waste the earth and devastate it. He will ruin its face and scatter its inhabitants. It will be the same for priest as for people, for master as for servant, for mistress as for maid, for sellers as for buyers, for borrower as for lender, for debtor as for creditor, the earth will be completely laid waste and totally plundered. The Lord has spoken this word. Now, when you think of laying something waste, I don't know what comes to your mind, but it's like wiping it out. And did you notice it's not the Lord is going to lay Babylon waste or the Egyptians waste or Jerusalem waste? We're talking the earth. The whole earth is going to be laid waste and there's not going to be any escape no matter who you are. That if you're high or if you're low, it's happening to you. If you're the loner or the borrower, if you're the boss or the worker, it doesn't matter who you are, it's happening to you. The word scattered stands out to me. He will ruin the face of the earth and scatter its inhabitants. When you hear the word scatter, well, I'm sure most of you think a word for the scattered. Okay, and I appreciate that. But here, Babel. Do you remember the story of the Tower of Babel way back in Genesis? God had given the word after the flood that humanity, Noah and his family and all humanity was to go out, spread forth over the earth, to multiply, to, to be fruitful. And you know that humanity was created in the image of God. And so as they spread out over the earth, what were they to do? What was their purpose? Our purpose to reflect God's image, to reflect God's character, to make God's name known to each other and to all creation. And instead, Genesis chapter 11, what we find is that this people was determined to make a name for themselves. And so they built this tower up to the heavens that instead of scattering out and reflecting God's name and God's goodness to all of creation, they decided, no, we're going to stay put. We're going to make a city and we're going to build a tower up into the heavens to make a name for ourselves. And we refuse to obey God. You know the outcome, right? They sure made a name for themselves. We're talking about them today. But it was a name of foolishness. Because God came down, saw their tower, and scattered them. Helped them be obedient in the midst of their disobedience. See, I, I think that's what's going on here. When God is going to lay waste the earth, it's just like God laid waste Babel and scattered the people and put an end to, the, to their rebelliousness and the things that they were doing. Isaiah sees a day in which God is basically going to come down and lay waste the earth and scatter the inhabitants. And it's going to be such a storm that nobody can escape the earthquake that you were in happened to everybody right 
the ground shook for everybody. The storm that you were in, it didn't matter what kind of car you were driving, you got hailed on. Everybody, no matter who you are, no matter what your status is, the Lord will lay waste the earth and bring this age to conclusion. And nobody's going to escape that. Nobody's going to be able to insulate themselves off from that. And notice that Isaiah emphasizes that this is the word that the Lord has spoken. And he says that to communicate that this is going to happen, that nobody will escape. Now look at the next set of verses, verses 4 through 6. The earth dries up and withers. The world languishes and withers. The exalted of the earth languish. The earth is defiled by its people. They have disobeyed the laws, violated the statutes, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore, a curse consumes the earth. Its people must bear their guilt. Therefore, earth's inhabitants are burned up and very few are left. Now, there's a connection that we don't often talk about between the sinfulness of humanity and the well-being of the earth. Now, I know some of you are thinking back to Genesis chapter 3 and Adam and Eve in the garden. And you remember that God's word to the man was not only did you come from dust and you're going to return to dust, but God's word was also that the ground is now cursed. And so you're going to have incredible difficulty farming and cultivating because your sin has brought about curse on the ground. And then some of you are probably thinking even about the next story with Cain and Abel. And you remember that Cain killed his brother Abel. And the Lord says to Cain, you know, where is your brother Abel? I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord tells Cain that Abel's blood is crying out from the ground. It's like Cain polluted the ground with Abel's brother, with the blood of his brother Abel. And, and as we read on, part of the sentence to Cain is now the ground, you are going to be cursed from the ground. So we move from a ground that is cursed to kind of a cursing ground. Then we get the flood because violence had corrupted all the flesh of the earth. All the flesh of the earth was corrupted by human violence. And so it's like the whole place is under curse. And God, God sends the flood and God says, okay, I'm not going to do that again. But we have kind of this covenant. And what we find God saying is that I'm going to hold you accountable for human bloodshed. The shedding of blood corrupts the earth. And what we're seeing here, Isaiah is calling out that the earth cannot handle the guilt of humanity any longer. And so it's like everything is drying up. Everything is shutting down. That human sinfulness has brought disaster, drought, fire, upon the earth and so therefore a curse consumes the earth its people must bear their guilt thinking more about this you know we hear a lot about climate change we hear a lot about global warming and we hear solutions solutions in terms of well we need to go electric electric cars no more fossil fuel vehicles, that we need to get rid of coal, we need to get rid of oil, that we need wind, we need solar, that these will be the ways that we kind of save the earth. You know what I think Isaiah would say? That if we really want to save the earth, we need to humble ourselves and repent of our sin. That we need to turn to God instead of turning to the sun and solar energy. That we need to turn to the spirit 
instead of turning to wind. That we need to own our sins, and our sins are way bigger than driving a gas-guzzling SUV or flying jets around. That when you just think about the atrocities that are committed across the face of the earth, they far outweigh whether I'm driving electric or driving gas. And if we really want to save the earth, if we really want to see renewal, then we got to start thinking about the ways in which we oppress each other and the systems of oppression and the governments of oppression. And at that point, if there would finally be some repentance and some change, we might have a greener earth. We might live in a better place. And so what Isaiah is doing is something that doesn't very often happen today, where he's actually connecting the well-being of the earth, not simply to humanity, but to the sinfulness versus the righteousness of humanity. And we are seeing, we know that sin is escalating. And as sin escalates, the earth comes under greater and greater curse. As the guilt goes up, the well-being of the planet goes down. And until there is a, a transformation of humanity, then the earth will continue to suffer under the guilt of humanity, under curse. Listen to the words again and just think about how relevant they are to the day in which we live. The earth dries up and withers. The world languishes and withers. The exalted of the earth languish. The earth is defiled by its people. They have disobeyed the laws, violated the statutes, and broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore, a curse consumes the earth. Its people must bear their guilt. Now, I want to be careful here. A couple weeks ago, earthquake in Haiti and an earthquake up in Alaska. I don't want anybody to think that I'm saying that the reason why Haiti had an earthquake and Alaska had an earthquake is because the Alaskans and the Haitians are more sinful than the rest of us. Okay? Don't go there. We're talking about the whole. And so the whole of humanity has become more and more rebellious against God, more and more arrogant, more and more guilty. And that guilt kind of piles up. And you can't say, well, there is an earthquake in Haiti. Their guilt piled up more than our guilt. The whole thing is connected, maybe like an ecosystem, to where the guilt in one place can bring disaster in another place. And so the whole world is suffering under the guilt of sin, the guilt of the human race. So, so don't, don't kind of pinpoint, you know, this disaster because of this people's sin. Maybe there are times where that happens, but I'm not in a place where I can make that call. I'll just put it that way. The other thing, I think there's two chief sins. One I mentioned already in terms of the covenant with Noah and bloodshed. As Paul talks about the human race in Romans chapter 1, he calls attention to our idolatry, that this is the big issue with the human race, not simply our violence, but our idolatry to where our tendency is, our disposition is to exchange the glory of the creator and worshiping created things. Allowing something that's created, maybe even something that quote unquote we've made, or that we think resembles us. And we worship that instead of worshiping the maker of the heavens and the earth. And Paul identifies that as kind of the root sin that the whole human race is guilty of. Exchanging the glory of the creator for worshiping created things. When we don't worship the creator, we bring curse upon the earth and guilt upon the earth. 
So Isaiah sees this day when all this is going to kind of come crashing in and everybody's going to get shaken up from it. Okay, we go a little bit further. He talks about how bad it's going to be, how dark it's going to be. So verse, verses 7 through 13 kind of run together. The new wine dries up and the vine withers. All the merrymakers groan. The gaiety of the tambourines is still. The noise of the revelers has stopped. The joyful harp is silent. What he envisions here is you have a city that's full of life. Maybe in our city it would be like the gas lamp district or maybe Little Italy and all the restaurants there. Um, but, but what has happened is that there's no more music. There's no more wine. There's no more drinking. The party has stopped. I think about Brother Eddie's song that he used to sing, What Will You Do When the Party's Over? Okay, this is what's going on right here. Isaiah sees this day when the earth can no longer bear the guilt. Everything is cursed. Everything is withered. And there's no grapes to be able to make the wine. There's no music. The harp has gone silent. No more joy. And so the, the city where there used to be such revelry and such joy is like the party is over. Look at verse 10. The ruined city lies desolate. The entrance to every house is barred. It's like a ghost town. In the streets they cry out for wine. All joy turns to gloom or darkness. All gaiety is banished from the earth. The city is left in ruins. Its gate is battered to pieces. So will it be on the earth and among the nations as when an olive tree is beaten or as when gleanings are left after the grape harvest. And so you have kind of this imagery, and again, it's poetic, and so you can't press it too far. But it's like the whole earth is characterized as this glorious city, whether it's Babel, whether it's Rome, whether you want to call out a city today. But the city's now desolate. It's been ruined. There's no more joy. There's no more revel revelry. And so it will be on the whole earth. Now, the next part is surprising. Verse 14, they raise their voices. They shout for what? Joy. They raise their voices. They shout for joy. From the west, they acclaim the Lord's majesty. From, therefore, in the east, give glory to the Lord. Exalt the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. In the islands of the sea, from the ends of the earth, we hear singing glory to the righteous one. So here we've had what, 13 verses of the earth being laid waste and just total devastation and total darkness and total gloom and no one can escape it. And then all of a sudden Isaiah says that they're singing. And they're singing from the west and they're singing from the east and they're singing on the islands and they're singing from kind of coast to coast, edge of the earth to edge of the earth. And what are they singing? Glory to God. And glory to the righteous one. Now, that's just wild to me. That in the midst of this devastation, there are some folks, a remnant if you will, that are singing glory. Glory to God. Glory to the righteous one. Well, I kind of want to know who are they? And how are they able to sing? When everyone else is full of gloom and darkness and under this curse, could it be that these are the ones who are trusting in the Lord? Could it be that these are the ones who know that God is righteous and that God is going to do right no matter what? Could it be that these are the ones who know that God is righteous to save? And that for all the dismantling God does, it's always for that righteous purpose of reconstruction so that people are right and that people do right and that people trust God and live God and live rightly before God. Again, I cannot help but think about Isaiah. What did he cry out when he saw how holy God was and how unclean he was? Woe is me. This is not going to end well. I am ruined. I am undone. 
And then he sees one of these fiery angels take a burning coal from the altar and bring that towards him. And I can just imagine him gasping and shrieking back and can't escape it. And that burning coal is applied to his unclean lips. And his sin is atoned for. His guilt is taken away. He is transformed from living to self to living to God. God has done him right. And so he's trusting him. Next words out of his mouth. Here am I. Send me. And I can't help but wonder if these ones who are singing glory to the righteous one, they know who God is. That in all of this judgment, God is actually doing them, doing earth, doing creation, doing right. And can be trusted that God will bring them through this. And that God will transform. And God will make a, a new heavens, a new earth, and make things right. Well, maybe I'm a little ahead of myself here. But you know the righteous one. Jesus. Jesus. That God does us right in Jesus. God deals with our sin in Jesus. That none of us are righteous before God in and of ourselves. None of us meet God's righteous standard. We're all under guilt. We're all under the curse of death. We're all the reason why the earth is like it is. None of us. But God did us right. God did right by his covenants to save and to bless by sending his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. That we could be saved, that we could be reconciled, that we could be made right with God and have peace with God. And not only have peace with God in terms of our past being dealt with, but to live at peace with God in terms of power through his spirit to do right day by day, decision by decision, to where our characters are transformed and our lives begin to reflect his love, his goodness, his image to one another and out into the world. Maybe this group that's singing, maybe they're the ones that have experienced this. Remember, he's, he's looking distant. And in the midst of all the devastation, he sees a group of folk. Here's a group of folk from east to west, giving praise and honor and glory to God, the righteous one righteous to save but then Isaiah jumps back and he sees all the devastation and his heart breaks with what he's seeing he's like he knows there's going to be salvation but he sees the devastation and so he's kind of in that overlap if you will of rejoicing that I'm going to come through this of rejoicing that God's going to bring people through this and yet the devastation that's there the only thing I know how to compare that to is to the passing of loved one that knows the Lord. That on the one hand, you're kind of rejoicing and celebrating that they're with the Lord and that they're at peace and that they've run the race. And at the same time, you're kind of crying inside that you're going to miss them. And maybe it was tragic that they didn't get to live out all their days here on earth or what we think were all their days. And so you have this kind of play going on to where on the one hand you're rejoicing, on the other hand you're grieving. And I think that's where Isaiah's at. And he begins to look around and he's just filled with this grief. And, and look at what he says, I waste away. I waste away, woe to me. And, and this line, I cannot get away from it. The treacherous betray. With treachery, the treacherous betray. Now, I don't know, treachery is not a word that we use a lot. At least I don't use it very much. And so I had to do some thinking in terms of, okay, what's going on with this word treachery? Now, when I looked the word up in Hebrew, it actually comes from the word to cover. So like 
one of the words that kind of is a derivative of it is the word begged, which means clothing. But the idea behind treachery, the idea behind this clothing is that it's not what it appears to be. That you're covering something, you're covert about it because you have an alternative motive. In other words, a treacherous person is a person that cannot be trusted. They'll appear one thing in terms of how they clothe themselves, in terms of how they might talk. But on the inside, something completely different. Instead of caring about you, they might only care about themselves. And caring about how you're doing, they might just be pursuing their own agenda. You know, if you're traveling a treacherous road, it means you can't travel that road with confidence. You don't know what danger might be lurking. When you're talking about a treacherous person, you don't know what they might do. And Isaiah looks at his world and looks at how the world is becoming more and more. And he's looking at the end and kind of the culmination of everything. And it's like there's treachery that nobody can be trusted. Anybody feel like that today? Who do you trust? Is there a news channel that you trust? Is there a politician that you trust? Is there a corporate figure that you trust? Is there a leader anywhere that you really trust? Treachery, treachery, treachery. It's like danger is lurking everywhere and you don't know who to trust. And so Isaiah is kind of seeing deep, and I think he's experienced it in his own time, but I think it's just multiplied in our time. It's like, how do you escape it? You think you, you, think you escape one pit, and there's another trap that you fall into as you're avoiding that pit. You think you figured somebody out, can't trust them, and in the process, you end up leaning on someone else that you should have never leaned on. I think this happens nationally. I think it happens globally. Just treachery everywhere. Who do we trust? The floodgates of the heavens are opened. The foundations of the earth shake. The earth is broken up. The earth is split asunder. The earth is thoroughly shaken. The earth reels like a drunkard. It sways like a hut in the wind. So heavy upon it is the guilt of its rebellion that it falls never to rise again. I mean, wow. That the earth can't hold up under the treachery of humanity any longer. And the whole thing just shakes. And the Lord's shaking it. In that day, the Lord will punish the powers in the heavens above and the kings on the earth below. You know, that might be worth saying amen to. I know that when we think about Judgment Day, we think, first of all, how scary that's going to be. But it might actually be a good day, an amen day, that the Lord is going to bring judgment upon all those powers, whether in the heavens or on the earth, that have lived in rebellion against God and brought such treachery upon the human race and upon the earth. In that day, the Lord will punish the powers in the heavens above and the kings on the earth below. They will be herded together like prisoners bound in a dungeon. They will be shut up in prison and be punished after many days. The moon will be abashed, the sun ashamed, for the Lord Almighty will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before its elders gloriously. The image is a new city. That the treacherous city, the treacherous world is laid waste. That those who have perpetrated the great treacheries will be judged and sentenced 
whether they be powers above or kings of the earth. And that it's going to be a new day. And there'll be a new city. New Jerusalem. A new temple. And did you catch the language? The moon and the sun. The brightest things we know will be ashamed. Because they will not compare to the glory of God and his presence there. Which is what we read about in Revelation. Isaiah seeing deep. John seeing deep. That God is about bringing to a close this age. And opening up this new age. Where even the sun and the moon kind of covered with shame. Because their brightness is nothing compared to the Lord Almighty. Now what do we do with this? And where are we on the timeline? Well, best way I've learned to think about this is that we are in this overlap of the ages. See, what has happened is Isaiah is looking deep to where God's kingdom is going to come and God's rule is going to be established and these treacherous powers will be judged. That begins to happen in Jesus. That when Jesus comes, God's kingdom is breaking in on the face of the earth. And we find people being set free and we find people being healed and we find people being forgiven and we find people who are lost being regathered and given a new life. All this begins to happen in Jesus. And it's like that future day of God's glorious reign is breaking into the world. That Jesus is that light. And at the same time, we find treachery after treachery. In fact, even one of Jesus' own disciples, Judas, filled with treachery, betrayed him. And Jesus was sentenced to death and was crucified. And it looked like in a moment, from one angle, that maybe treachery won. But you know that God is greater. And God was working through evil that was in Judas's heart and so many's heart to bring good. God is righteous. And so God raised up Jesus from the dead and vindicated him and exalted him. And so that through Jesus, atonement was accomplished. Forgiveness was accomplished. Reconciliation was accomplished. And now Jesus is at God's right hand interceding for us. And one day we'll return and establish the fullness of God's kingdom on the face of the earth. And we'll have a new heavens and a new earth. And instead of everything withering and being laid waste, that laying waste will be made new. Much as Jesus' crucified body laid in the grave, was resurrected and healed and made alive. So we're in the middle of that. We know treachery, but we know the righteousness of God. And we know that God has done us right in Christ Jesus. We know that God forgives us and offers us grace in Christ Jesus. We know that God has done us right and will make a way for us in and through Christ Jesus. We know that God will empower us to live rightly in the midst of a treacherous world. And so while treachery may characterize our world, it doesn't have to characterize me. It doesn't have to characterize you. That we can be characterized by righteousness rather than treachery. Not a righteousness of our own, but a righteousness of that is found in Christ who gave himself for us. And so we can kind of start singing. That the singing's just not at the end. That yeah, we grieve now, but we can also sing praise and honor and glory to the righteous one even now. And so John Mark and ladies, if you would come and 
lead us in Waymaker, I'd like for us to play that, sing that one more time, realizing that in the midst of our world of treachery, we serve the righteous one. And the righteous one will make a way for us through the treachery. The righteous one will make a way for us, has made a way for us, will empower us to live rightly. The righteous one is at work on our behalf in the midst of the treachery as we anticipate this new age coming in its fullness. So I invite you to stand to join with me in singing Waymaker. And Bryce, if you can take us backwards to that. And thank you, Bryce, for helping out on the PowerPoint today. We got John Mark on the keyboard today. Oh. Get the microphone to someone that can sing.
Well, I'm going to pray, and um, you're welcome to come and pray if you want. Um, but while I pray, John Mark, if you would just go ahead and play it a little bit longer, and I'll pray. And if you would like to come and kneel and pray uh, in the world of treachery, Lord, change me so that I'm not like the world, a treacherous person, but I'm like you, a righteous one, and that you'll make a way for me. So I'll pray. John Mark's going to play. And if you'd like to come and pray, you're welcome to. No pressure whatsoever. But let's turn our hearts to the Lord. Lord, in you there's no treachery. In you there's no darkness. You are light. Make us like you. In this world of treachery, we find ourselves infected with that not just a victim of it, but infected by it. Change us, we pray. We don't want to be of the character of the world, treacherous people, unreliable people, deceitful people. Change us in your righteousness. Change us and make us righteous so that as in you, so be in us. No darkness but we are a people that walks in the light, that lives in the light. We thank you for the hope that we have in Christ, the righteous one. Thank you for, in your righteousness, making a way for us to be right with you. Empower us by your spirit to go forth from here and to do right, to practice righteousness. And may we always have a song, no matter what's going on around us, to be able to sing to you the glorious one, the righteous one, the one worthy of our trust, the one worthy of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with you all. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, God bless. Thank you for being here. I think we might have some cake and ice cream. We want to celebrate the June, July, and August birthdays. So if you have a June, July, or August birthday, raise your hand. Vada. Oh, all right. So we're going to sing happy birthday to everybody all at once. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear July and August Happy birthday to you. Amen. Amen. God bless. Good job, John Mark.